All right, so in your groups, when you talked about that discussion question, who heard the most adventurous thing that somebody fixed that you can't believe somebody actually tackled something? Did anything big or great come up? No? Just fixing common stuff? <laughs> Plumbing, electrical? Yeah, nobody rewired a Honda or nothing like that? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you know, we own a lot of things, and, and in our journey of being car owners and homeowners and everything else, every once in a while something breaks and it needs to be restored, right? Something, you know, bre breaks down, and maybe you don't have that $500 in your pocket, and maybe you're trying it yourself and got to give it a go, amen? <laughs> amen, that's what we got, all these lovely do-it-yourselfers here, I know. But I got to tell you something. I've become a fan of HGTV. Yes, real men watch HGTV, <laughs> don't we? Yes. Don't let me be alone, men. I know you're watching it. Come on now. And uh, when my wife and I started watching it, some of our favorite shows were like Love It or List It and House Hunters, which, you know, we still watch. Although she's waning on House Hunters. I don't know why, but I, I still like House Hunters. But my favorite shows uh, are those where... Uh, you see actual restoration taking place on people's homes or renovations. Um, uh, they, they got this one show called uh, Fixer the Fabulous, a married couple, and I think they do a tremendous job in helping people realize a, a dream home out of a home that they own. But my favorite show probably right now is the show says, Help, I Wreck My House. <laughs> Anybody ever seen Help, I Wreck My House? Okay, a couple of us. So there's a young lady named Jasmine Roth, and she lives in California, and she's a remodeler, designer, builder. And what happens when people try to do their own uh, renovations or restorations, and they just tear up their house, they call Jasmine. And she comes in and sees the, about the mess they made. She's real kind, cause if, <laughs> because people are really wrecking their house. And she comes in, and she helps them put their house back together and restore it to something better than it was. And I got to tell you, um, I, again, I watch a show every chance I get, and you can't, and they always show the before and after pictures, and you can't imagine, you know, that she's able to make right out of what's been done wrong in some people's houses. And I can't imagine some people do these things to their own house. But again, some of us are adventurous and do try our own DIY or DIY projects. But if it's done right, and Jasmine always does it right, does it right, the result is always to produce something better than it was. And I want to talk this morning about that because we also know that that is God's design, or we should know that is God's design in restoration or restoring us, is to restore it better than it was. So if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to 1 Peter, we're going to be in chapter 5, and I'm going to read uh, verses 5 through 10. And we'll be in some other scriptures, but we're going to do most of our uh, focus uh, this morning on 1 Peter 5, 5 through 10. And reading, it says, likewise, you are younger, be subject to the elders, close yourselves, all of you. So that's not just the elders, but elders and everyone, and close yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. Now, again, we're in this wonderful first Sunday of the new year, and I pray that you all had a wonderful holiday season. And some of you may be riding into this new year on a wave of blessings. I mean, 2023 was just your year. Everything went right. You know, no major trauma in your life. 
family's well, blessed with a promotion on your job, got plenty of money in the bank. 23 was your year, and, and you're riding that momentum into 2024. But I also know some of you may be weary, bruised, and, and worn out a little. 2023 was that type of year where you ran into circumstances and issues that weighed you down a little bit, that caused you to be weary and a little worn out, and that's okay. And so you're coming into this year hoping for better. Some of you may actually have experienced some serious setbacks in 2023. You may have lost loved ones or something traumatic may have happened in your life. You may have been separated uh, from family or you may have had a significant separation from family or you may have lost a job and employment is scarce and, and you're, way, you're riding into 2024 hoping for restoration of things in your life. And as always, we know that some people are riding into this year the same way they ended 23, that they don't have a relationship with God. And they're in need of that ultimate restoration that only Jesus provided in terms of bringing you back to God through him being your savior. And so whatever your circumstances are, as we start this year, our lives, our relationships may be in need of restoration. And just like what we see on HDTV, God's design in restoring whatever you need in your life is to restore it better than it was. Amen? Amen. Now, if we look at 1 Peter 5, it's beginning at the fifth verse. What I want to talk about a little bit is the need for restoration. And if you look at what Peter is laying out here, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing that he's actually taken the the antithesis or the converse or the opposite of what he's saying here. And we can take those and say, wow, those things actually produce need for restoration. So I'm going to need you to help me a little bit. So when I say, what's the opposite? You got to tell me what the opposite is, okay? All right, so in 1 Peter, verse 5, it says, Likewise, you are younger, be subject to the elders. Close yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What is the opposite of being humble? Pride. Pride. If you look at the opposite of being humble, being proud can be a cause for you to need restoration. Amen? Pride in your lives can be a big issue that separates you from relationships, can separate you from loved ones, and absolutely pride can be a reason why you get separated from God and causes restoration to be needed in your life. And we have a wonderful example when we think about one of my favorite people in the Bible, Peter. I talk about Peter a lot. I really love Peter. A lot of Peter's life is my life, which is why I have to love him. Everybody knows who Peter was, right? One of the 12. Peter was the cocky one. Peter one was the one out front. Peter was the one always putting his foot in his mouth. Amen? Amen. And we also know that over in, in Matthew 26, when Jesus was sharing at a very poignant moment with the disciples that on this night where he was about to be taken, there's going to be some things that happen that will cause some of you to scatter not some of you, but all of you, to scatter and separate. And what did my man Peter do? He said, no, nope, not me, Lord. I am never going to leave you. Peter was having a proud moment, right? And that pride wasn't in his love for Jesus. Pride was in himself thinking that he was something that he really wasn't. But none of us are like that, amen? <laughs> but Peter had that moment. And what did Jesus tell him? He said, before this night is done, you will what? Deny me three times. And we all know that that happened. And on the third time when it happened, when Peter actually said, I know not this man, he actually cried and ran out when Jesus and him made eye contact because he knew what Jesus said was true. But he had too much pride just to listen to Jesus. And Peter was in need of restoration. And we'll talk a little bit about what actually happened with Peter, but we know restoration did 
come to Peter. Amen. So pride being the opposite of humility is telling us here that we need to be humble so that at the right time God will exalt us. Well, if we're going to be pride, you're not going to get exalted. Right. And the pride will cause you to do things just like Peter did and be in need of restoration. And I don't know about you, but I've had those moments in my life where I've been too proud to where I've actually fractured relationships with family, with friends, with my wife, because I was too proud and I wasn't humble. But thank God he provided restoration. He's a God that says there is a way back. And you know what? We know all the verses. We know where it says that, you know, uh, 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 pride goes what? Before fall, right? And haughtiness, what? You know? It, but we know those things, but yet and still, we hold on to those things that keep us from having great relationships and keep us from God, and we are in need of restoration in that case. If you go down and read in verse 7, here's another one, and we're going to talk about the opposite of this, and you don't have to yell it out because we're going to have to talk about it for a minute. But it's verse 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Where are the fishermen in the house? Who are the fishermen? Raise your hand. Fisher? Come on, raise your hand high. Come on, you guys fish. <laughs> now, I got to ask you something. When you fish, when you cast, is cast a passive thing you do? Or is casting something that you have to put a lot of effort into? It depends. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I prefer the answer that you got to put effort into casting. <laughs> I don't fish, so I don't know. Sometimes maybe you get and just drop your line in the water. But what I want to focus on here, again, thanks, Steve. But what I want to focus on here is the element of casting. Because when you cast, you know, let's just say we're going for something big. Okay, Steve? Deep, deep sea diving? And you have to get it away from the boat. What do you have to do? You got to get it out there. You got to cast. And that's what it says here. It says, cast your anxieties. That means throw, put some effort. Don't keep them what? Close to you. It's like you can't keep a fishing line close to you and catch nothing big. You got to, and I don't even fish, I know that. <laughs> but you got to do that. So when we do the opposite of casting, what are we doing? We're holding. We're holding our anxieties. And in holding our anxieties, we can get in a little trouble where we may need Restoration because we may get separated. And we have some wonderful examples in the Bible. And one of my favorite is when we talk about the prophet Elijah. Great prophet. Wonderful things, wonderful miracles. God used Elijah greatly. God is, 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 has used Elijah to talk to the nation of Israel because they're disobedient. And he talked to wicked king Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. Yeah, Jezebel's real. Don't ever call a woman Jezebel. That was a bad thing when I was young because they kind of knew who Jezebel was. I don't even know if they know who she is right now, but don't call anybody Jezebel. <laughs> Jezebel was a wicked evil queen. But in the time of Elijah and how God used him, Elijah still had anxiety. And he had a moment where he kept anxiety close to him. And Elijah was bad, I'm telling you. You guys remember that story over in, in, in 1 Kings, it, over in uh, chapter 18, where he had this great standoff, where the people were so wicked, and they were following Baal, and they were worshiping Baal, and worshiping evil, and Elijah, by the strength of God, said, okay, we're going to have a standoff. We're going to have this show enough once and for all, throw down standoff to determine whose God is God, Right? And so we, what we're going to do, we're going to, first of all, we're going to kill a couple of bulls. And you can, and he's talking to the 450 prophets of Baal and said, you guys pick your bull. And we're going to have a wooden altar. We're going to have stones and you're going to cut up your bull and you're going to set your, your sacrifice on the altar. And, and I'm going to do the same. And we're going to see whose God is God. And, and, and how we're going to determine that is you got to call down fire. And whoever God's answer and call down fire wins, Right? So the prophets of Baal, the 450 plus another 400 prophets of Azra, built their altar, cut up their bull, cast it, and they prayed for hours. They prayed for hours. 
They prayed so long that Elijah started teasing them. Say, what's going on with your God? He may be somewhere relieving himself. That's an interpretation. But he said he wasn't around. And they prayed for hours and nothing ever happened. And so then Elijah's turn came. He says, all right, build my altar. Going to build uh, 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 the, 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 the rocks and the stone and the, and, and the wood and put them together. I'm going to put my bull on it. And guess what else I'm going to do? I'm going to dig a trench. And what did he have him do? He had people pour water on three different occasions to soak the ground around it and to soak the bull that he had cut up. And when he prayed to God and, 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 and said, God, it's time to show them who you are. What did God do? Fire came from heaven, right? Burnt the altar, burnt the bull, sopped up all the water out of the drenchers. Who wins? That was Elijah. That's a, that's, Elijah was bad. Wasn't Elijah bad? And God, come on, you guys can agree Elijah was bad. But Elijah then, and there's a lot more to the story. You ought to go over and read it. It's a wonderful story. But Elijah then had a moment of anxiety. Let's turn over to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4 says, Ahab, who was the evil king who witnessed all these things, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She threatened him. She threatened to kill him. And what did Elijah do? What was his response? It says in verse 3, Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die saying, is it enough now, O Lord? Take my life away, for I am no better than my father's. All that Elijah had done just in this previous moment, he was still subject to what? Anxiety. Even in the strength of the Lord, we can be subject to anxiety in our life. Anybody have any of that in 23? Anybody have that yesterday? Yes, we have anxiety. And anxiety can be a cause. When we don't cast our anxieties out, I mean, cast out, like with deep sea fishing, Steve, cast out. <laughs> when we hold on to our anxieties, they can cause us to have separation. And then we can be in need of restoring a relationship. And Elijah found himself in that need. And if you go on and read in the rest of 19 and 20, God did restore him. God restored him greatly because he had more for Elijah to do. But yes, Elijah still had that anxious moment. Then if we go down, going back to 1 Peter and looking at another cause of why we may need restoring. Let's go down to where it says in verse 8. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So the first part of that, if we're saying be sober-minded, be watchful, the opposite of that would be what? To be drunk on yourself or other things? The opposite of not being watchful is the what? Be asleep. Be off guard. To have your guard down. Where are the boxers in the house? Watch everybody raise their hand. No boxers in the house? None? Okay, no one is ever boxed. Shadow boxed. Pretend to box. Come on. Do something. Let me ask you another question. Anybody been in a fight? All right, here we go. What's the first position when you're getting ready to fight? Hands up. Put your guard up right. Now, some of you ain't going to stop you from getting hit because you don't know what you're doing. But when we're in a fight, 
And we are daily. When it says what? Be watchful, it means be alert. Keep your guard up. The opposite of that is to keep our guard down and be subject to what? The temptations and the wiles of the devil. And guess what? And get hit a lot in boxing terms. We got wonderful examples of that that we can read and study about. And one of the, one of the most famous people in the Bible was subject to his guard being down and being caught off guard. David. King David. Right? Who God had done wonderful things through from him. Slaying Goliath. Right? Keeping him from Saul, keeping him safe and restoring him as king or putting him on the throne as king. Yet David had a moment when his guard went down. Saw a pretty woman, right? And some of you may say, well, the devil didn't have nothing to do that. That was just David. David's guard was down. How does temptation come to us? And some sweet, pretty things sometimes. Amen? Those things that we pretend like we don't want to look at or don't want to like, but yet let it get in front of us and our eyes are all over it. And next thing you know, you know, that thought has gone down to actions. And, and because of what was in his heart at the time, it came out. And David had to have who? Come on, y'all, you preach this. Bathsheba. He had to have her because he saw her and she was pretty. And that led to what? Adultery. Then adultery led what? Murder. To murder. Murder led what? To cover up. Because his guard was down. He wasn't being watchful. He wasn't guarding his heart. He wasn't guarding his soul. And because of that, David needed what? Restoring. And yes, we know that God did restore him. We have that wonderful psalm over in Psalm 51 where David, and yes, sometimes to get restoration with God, we got to repent because we've done something against God. And you can't have restoration without repenting when you sin against God. And so David did. In that wonderful psalm, David said, Lord, I've sinned and I am need of restoration. He said, return to me the joy of your salvation because he had lost it because of his wrong." And the other thing that's wonderful as a part of that is that God was wonderful and was able to use an illustration that was given to David by Nathan. And you know, sometimes we need to listen to our godly friends so that restoration can begin. You know, sometimes we don't have time when we've been in sin and we don't have time to listen to anyone trying to correct us, trying to talk to us, trying to tell us something. We know it's all wrong in our spirit and other people know it's wrong. We don't want to hear from them. We do what? We give them the hand. But David had no choice but to listen to Nathan. And Nathan made it plain. And David said, oh, that's me. I am the one who took another man's sheep. And so in our restoration, sometimes we need to repent. And we need to listen to that wise counsel, that voice that helps us to see where we are and where we need and are in need of God's restoration. Now, the lack of humility, not being uh, or not casting out our anxieties and, and not being firm in our faith are all examples of the cause for restoration, as well as sometimes they can prevent restoration from occurring because we hold on to pride. We hold on to our anxieties. We hold on to the sin in our life. So God is anxious and ready to restore when any of those things cause separation. But we have to be willing to look at ourselves and have God look at us and give up those things that have caused that separation that has occurred in our life. And if we go back to 1 Peter 5 and 10, and this is the one that will affect us all. You may be a very humble person. God bless you. You may be very good at casting your anxieties on him. That's wonderful. You may be excellent at keeping your guard up. But that doesn't mean you're going to get away with not being a little worn out, not having struggles, not having things that come up 
against you. If you look here now at verse 9, at the bottom of it, it says, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We are all going to suffer in this life. Again, you can be wonderful at those other things that we talked about earlier. But in this life, because we follow Christ, sometimes we just are going to suffer. We're going to have trials and we're going to have tribulations. Let's turn over to John 16, 33. Jesus cannot be any more clearer. When he was talking to his disciples, he was also talking to us. He said, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. But you know what? In this world, you will have tribulation. And like I said earlier, it may not be self-induced. It may not be because you're holding anxiety or because you're holding sin or because you're pride. Sometimes we just have to go up against it because we're part of God's family. And guess what? The devil's going to be good at his job, and he's got to be good at his job because he ain't got but a short time to try to prove a point. But we also have to be encouraged because it says, take heart because I have overcome the world. Some of the things that some of you may have gone through, you may be asking, Lord, I had no part in this. What, why is this upon me? Right? And you get down and your spirit gets down and you get worn out. And that is a wonderful time to remember the God who can restore you. Such as it is that happened to Job. Amen. Had Job done anything? Job had just been a wonderful, loving servant of God. And Satan said, let me let me hold that a minute. Let me let me reach out and touch him. Right. And ultimately, okay, God said, touch everything but his life. Job lost everything, sons, daughters, cattle, riches, you know, wife told him to curse God and die. Amen. Job, even if you read the whole book, Job even got a little testy, didn't he? And had some questions of God. Amen. But we also know that God was able to what? Restore. Amen. God put it back together and God, God made it better than it was, didn't he? And we don't have it, and you don't have to pull it up, uh, uh, Zami, but if you go over to Job and you look in the final chapter there in verse, uh, uh, verse 10 of, of chapter 42, it said, God doubled everything he lost. And you know why? Not just because of his obedience, because sometimes people need to see who you believe in. People need to see who's blessing you. People need to see after you've been in the trough. People need to see after you've been down. People need to see after your weakest moment <coughs> that God is able to restore all that the locust has eaten and bring it back to you. And that's what happened to Job. And that's what happens in your life. That's what happened in our life. God is always there to make it better than it was. Now, just like I talked about on HGTV and and the design that the designers have, that they're not there to put things back the way that they were. They're there to make things better than it was. And we also know that that is God's design in restoration. He wants us better. He wants us stronger and more capable than we were. Imagine this. Imagine if God was only restoring us to the point at which we were our weakest, if he was only restoring us to the moment before we had our issue. We're that same old person. We're not any better. We're still subject to being proud, to having all the anxieties, to, to having our guard down, because all he did was just take us back to where we were. Now, if you put that in, in, in a house designer's term, how many of you are going to let somebody come in your house rip things out, and then put it back together with the same material they ripped out. You going to let them use those same rusty nails that they pulled out? I don't think so. Think so. You going to let them use that same wood that was already rotted? They say, hey, that's still good wood. I'm going to put that back here. I'm just going to put some duct tape on it. <laughs> and we all know all you do it yourself, no duct tape fix everything. <laughs> no, it don't. <laughs> we just say that. Now, I have duct tape a lot of stuff, <laughs> but it doesn't fix everything. We cannot 
believe that God would not make us better than we were before the point in which we need restoring. Because he has what? More for you to do. Go back to Peter. Peter, devastated. Devastated by what he had done. And more devastated because everybody knew what he had done. <clears throat> Embarrassed beyond means. But God pulled him back. God had a moment with him. And then God had another moment with him at the fish fry. Didn't he? You guys remember the fish fry? You guys remember the fish fry they had, right? Jesus cooked breakfast. And he took Peter off to the side and he said, you know, Peter, do you love me? What did Peter say? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. And Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, yeah, I love you. Jesus said, tend to my sheep. And Jesus did what? Jesus said, one more time. Peter, do you really love me? Peter, probably frustrated because maybe he thought Jesus wasn't hearing him. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. How many times was that? How many times did Peter deny? Bringing it all back for Peter to be fully restored. Why? Because Peter had more to do. Jesus needed Peter better, stronger, and more capable than he was before that moment in which he denied him. Because that moment before he denied him, what was Peter? Cocky, prideful, full of himself. And he needed to be better than he was. And Jesus made him better than he was through his restoration power. I think about some of the projects that I've done in my house. And I think about some of the projects that I've had to do twice <laughs> in my house. And I think about some of the projects I've had to fix three times in my house. And it was because I wasn't capable of making it and restoring it to better than it was. And I had to do what? End up swallowing pride, picking up the phone, <laughs> calling that professional. Some of you get online now and find that YouTube video that gives you all the steps. You know, yep, you're too prideful to look at it. Well, you turn on YouTube first time. I just need to watch the first 60 seconds. I got the rest. <laughs> but you got to watch all the steps. Sometimes you just need that professional though, right? Sometimes you just need the professional. And guess who our professional is when we need restoration? Who is it? A man. We know who it is. Go down here with me to verse 10. 1 Peter 5 and 10, it says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself. He didn't say, the God of all glory will let you, or the God of all glory didn't let your favorite podcast restore you. The God of all glory didn't let your favorite, you know, uh, person to watch on YouTube restore you. It says the God of glory himself will restore you. Sometimes we have to let the professional be the professional. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we can't leave things to the DIY in us. Some of you don't want to hear that. It's DIY, right? Do it yourself. Some of you don't want to hear that because some of you can fix everything. I'm here to tell you this morning when it comes to restoring your relationships, restoring your trust in God, restoring your trust in you, you need the professional. Back to my home example. How many of you who have a leak in your house and call the plumber would say, I'm glad you're here, but I can't let you see the source of the leak. I just want you to get up the water and tell me what to do once you get here. Yeah, plumber's not going to stay if that's your attitude, right? He needs what? He needs access. He needs access. When your AC goes out or when your heater, this time of year when your heater goes out and your heat don't come on, 
I don't need any of you fixing your own heaters. I hope you're not. Stay away from that. That's gas. How many of you would call the heater or the AC repairman and say, come to my house. You stand at the front door. Let me have your tool belt. And I want you to yell instructions so I can do it myself. I just needed you to be here to tell me. It's a professional. He needs what? Access. So that he can do the restoration of your unit. God needs access to hear. When things happen in our lives, God, as the professional, needs access. you got to let him have access so he may do the restoration work that needs to be done. David even knew that. You go back to that wonderful psalm in verse 51, and David said, Lord, Created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I can't make my heart clean. I can't renew myself. I need you to restore me through the things that are wrong in me. Make me better than I was. That's why he needed a clean heart and a new spirit. The process of restoration is one that only God can do. And when God's ready to restore, what does he do? In the bottom of verse 10 here, it says, and the God who has called you in his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Zem, if you put those points up there, that's where we're going to end it this morning. When the professional comes in, He's going to do the work of restoration that needs to be done. And you know what he's going to tell you? Uh, let me have access. I'll call you when I need you. You know, but I'm doing this for you. And I'm going to make it better than it was. He's going to restore us. He's going to perfect us. He's going to make us fit for the work that needs to be done. That's why we need to be better than we were because there's work that needs to be done. He's going to equip us with every good thing that we need so that we can do his work. He's also going to confirm us. He's going to ensure that we have the support of a firm foundation. We need to be on a firm foundation to do his work as a better Jimmy, as a better Josh, as a better Linda. We need to be confirmed. We need to be strengthened so that we can overcome the forces that come against us. They're coming daily. It's only the strength that we have in him, not ourselves. It's the strength that we have in him that helps us resist the fiery darts of the devil. Amen. Amen. And then he's going to establish us. He's going to keep us from wavering so that nothing shakes our hope or that nothing shakes our faith. That's how we get to be restored better than we were. We're restored. We're confirmed. We're strengthened. And we're established. And we're better than we were when he restores us. You know, I love that we're reading this here in 1 Peter. Peter's the author of 1 Peter, if anybody didn't know that. It's called 1 Peter because he wrote it. But Peter could write this because of what he experienced. Peter could write this because he lived this. Peter could write this because he fell because of pride. He could write this because Jesus restored him to be better than he was. Peter had firsthand experience. Some of you have firsthand experience. Tina, I wouldn't guess that you could lead us like you do if you haven't been restored. God's restored. Josh can't go six Sundays in a row without being restored. Amen. Amen. We need to be restored by God so that we can do what he has designed for us to do. And when he does it for us, we're going to be better than we were, better than it was. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel 
or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you, and thanks for being part of our online service today.